So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, Marshall and Israel. And uh, it's, a, it's a complex subject. Uh, it uh, it's includes not only Marshall and Israel, but Marshall and Truman, uh, and Marshall and Clark Clifford, and Richard Holbrook, and Marshall and the subject of anti-Semitism. So there's a lot that's packed into this, and I'm going to try to unpack it for you as we move through. I'd like to leave about 10 or 15 minutes at the end because uh, so he's promised a lot of questions. Well, Marshall spent uh, 50 years in the public service, 44 in the military and six in uh, civilian leadership. And those six years in civilian leadership were, uh, were monumental, to say the least. Uh, he had uh, just come back from uh, China, where he had gone uh, on his, after his first retirement, he went to China, at President Truman's request to try to work out negotiation and peace between Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek. Kind of an impossible errand, but he, uh, he, he did actually very well. And someone should write the book uh, as, to, uh, as to how Marshall succeeded in China, not how he failed. And one of the ways he succeeded in China was he prepared himself uh, for his career as Secretary of State. And his abilities as a negotiator and as a mediator uh, were, were virtually second to none. Uh, he became, he remade himself from a military uh, man into a great statesman. And he did it uh, after his first retirement. Uh, Jews, American Jews are often very ambivalent regarding Marshall, despite the uh, massive achievements of the man over his 50-year career. Why is that? Well, it all stems from his opposition to President Truman and Truman's decision uh, to, uh, to immediately recognize the uh, new Jewish state as the British withdrew from their mandatory uh, leadership in Palestine on, the, on May 14th, 1948. And uh, that uh, led to suspicion uh, of anti-Semitism, uh, that anti-Semitism had played some role uh, in that opposition that Marshall uh, gave to uh, Truman on that occasion. And I'm here to, to, to dispel that and also to talk about the uh, overall record of Marshall in Israel, uh, with regard to Israel, uh, and also uh, with regard to uh, this uh, suggestion and implication. No one ever said Marshall was anti-Semitic, but there was a suggestion in, re in writings by Clark Clifford and Richard Holbrook that there was some anti-Semitism in the State Department and that Marshall was influenced by it. Uh, so I want to deal with that uh, very directly. Uh, what is anti-Semitism? Anti-Semitism is uh, simply defined as hostility toward Jews and, and the uh, Jewish people. And it may be based on behaviors, it may be based on history, uh, and, uh, uh, and it has uh, a long history, as you all know, and I'm not going to talk about the roots of anti-Semitism today, uh, but let's just simply define it. There are other terms besides anti-Semitism that, that get in, into play here, and the word Zionism is also a word that you need to be aware of. Now, technically, Zionism, since Zionism simply means uh, the historical uh, the, the desire to return to the land of Zion, uh, the return of the Jews to their uh, their historic homeland. That's what Zionism is. It's, it's that urge, it's that, uh, that desire. Now, sometimes the word Zionist is used in a coded way uh, to uh, hide or to mean anti-Semitism. So when the word Zionist is used in Middle Eastern countries, 
in Arab uh, nations, it's often used as a as an epithet, as a as a charge, as a as to imply anti-Semitism. Uh, Zionist is a dirty word in much of the uh, Middle East. Uh, and of course, uh, you've heard of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is a fabricated uh, tale about Jews trying to uh, conquer the world, which has been, uh, which has been uh, uh, so discredited um, over the years. And yes, yet that is a belief system that that has uh, existed in some places in the world, including in the United States. And then there's the word anti-Israeli or anti-Israel. Now, does this imply anti-Semitism? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, many Jews uh, oppose Israeli government and Israeli policies. Uh, I certainly uh, oppose uh, uh, some of the policies of Israel. Uh, and that doesn't make me an anti-Semite, not by a long shot. But uh, there are some, sometimes uh, those who are expressing anti-Semitic beliefs may talk in terms of being against Israel, and that kind of hides uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of feelings and, and implications. It may not. So it's a very it's a very slippery uh, term to use. When George Marshall entered his new office as Secretary of State, which was then across from the White House, on January 21st, 1947, he found uh, two things on his desk. One was a note from Harry Truman, and it read, the only major political issue between the United States and the United Kingdom which may require your immediate attention is the question of Palestine. And the other thing he found on his desk was a uh, briefing book. And that was from the Near East Affairs Office of the, of the U.S. Department of State, uh, led by a guy named uh, Lloyd Henderson. Lloyd Henderson uh, and several of the uh, people in that division, as well as other places in the State Department, uh, were admittedly pro-British, uh, pro-Arab, and in many cases, anti-Semitic. And uh, there's a lot of documented uh, uh, history about the State Department's activities before, during, and after World War II, uh, which documents uh, a, a, a very uh, unwholesome a history of anti-Semitism. Now there are others that uh, were in play too, besides the uh, professionals at the State Department uh, and uh, President Truman. Now Truman, he didn't say it in his note, but it was very obvious that uh, Harry Truman had a, uh, a great sympathy for the uh, Jewish survivors of the of the Holocaust, and uh, he, and along with uh, many state legislatures, both political parties, and and lots of American uh, political leaders and politicians, um, also joined him uh, in their support for a Jewish homeland and a Jewish uh, state. Now the British uh, were in a somewhat different situation. Now, if you go back to 1917 and the Balfour De Declaration, this was a policy statement uh, which uh, basically set out British support for the eventual idea of, uh, of the return of Jews to uh, the land of Zion and the creation of a homeland and eventually an independent state uh, in the land of Palestine. So the British were on record very early uh, for championing the cause of Zionism. Now, that uh, was uh, strengthened by the League of Nations, which in effect gave Britain the mandatory power in Palestine to, in effect, rule over Palestine and try to keep the peace, keep the peace and also uh, see that Jews uh, could find uh, areas in Palestine where they could make their home. This policy began to change uh, the British uh, 
policy of, of pro-Zionism began to change somewhere between World War I and World War II. And a lot uh, occurred, but primarily what changed the British uh, points of view were the developing uh, the connections and relationships with the Arab states, particularly the uh, growing dependence on oil uh, from the Middle East. And uh, Britain, in effect, created the country of Europe, Transjordan it was called it at that time, and the British uh, armed uh, the Transjordanians by establishing the Arab Legion. And the Arab Legion was basically British trained, British armed, and British funded. That uh, policy continued and strengthened. In 1939, the British uh, government issued the white, a white paper and the white paper was a policy paper which restricted immigration, Jewish immigration, into Palestine. Uh, kept it uh, to a very low number and also prevented Jews from buying land from Arabs uh, in Palestine. So the British had definitely tightened up and changed their, uh, uh, their posture with regard to Zionism. In the post-war era, starting uh, 45, 46, uh, the, British, uh, the British were in a bad position. They were suffering a great economic privation. Uh, there's a lot of poverty in Great Britain. Uh, they were losing uh, the jewel of the Indian Empire, or of the British Empire, which was uh, India. Uh, and they were being attacked. Uh, they were trying to keep the peace in Palestine, but, and uh, sort of. Uh, they, they, they tended to favor the Arabs in many of the disputes, but they, uh, to be fair to the British, they were being attacked by a, uh, a terrorist faction of the uh, Israeli defense, of the Jewish defense, uh, which was called, headed by something called the Jewish Agency at that time. But there was a faction of the Jewish Agency which was called the Ergun, and the Ergun, you've heard of Nachman Begin, uh, he was the leader of the Ergun, uh, and they uh, made war on the British. They attacked British, uh, uh, British uh, uh, installations and British personnel. They bombed the King David Hotel and killed uh, many British soldiers uh, there in 1946, I believe, or 47. Uh, so they were, uh, in effect, creating havoc for the British. Well, all of these factors, the British interest other than in Palestine, their interest in India, their growing poverty, their, uh, uh, their being on the defensive in Palestine uh, caused them to announce that they were going to pull out, they were going to end their rule in Palestine, end their position as the head of mandatory uh, Palestine. And they said that they were going to leave, they uh, applied for permission to the United Nations and the United Nations uh, gave them permission, and they said they were going to leave sometime in the summer of 1948. And that was announced in uh, early 1947. So that's the situation. Uh, you have about a year, a year and a half, that you're looking at uh, how are you going to uh, bring about something in Palestine which is going to prevent uh, Arabs and Jews from killing each other. Uh, and arrive at some sort of some sort of uh, mutual accommodation which will allow uh, both sides to uh, uh, to survive and prosper well let's take a look at Marshall's actions as he came into the Secretary of State's position uh, in early 1947 he uh, as he did throughout his career he, he was uh, a great believer in uh, the military subordination to the politically elected government, to the Constitution. And Truman was his lodestar. Uh, he served Truman as the, uh, as the, uh, as his role in, as president. He also led the United States delegation to the United Nations, an organization which he greatly believed in. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was a member of that delegation, there are some other interesting members of that delegation, uh, Adlai Stevenson, uh, Dean Rusk, 
the, the ambassador to the UN, the head of that delegation, was a fellow by the name of uh, Warren Austin, who was a senator from uh, New England, uh, a Republican. Uh, so he has some very strong uh, actors within the UN, the U.S. delegation to the UN uh, at that time. Eleanor Roosevelt uh, became a great fan of Marshall. She said he was a, a quite a, quite an advocate and quite a leader. Uh, she turned him, I, and I quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, a wonderfully good chief. And she said there was no greater patriot or truer servant of his country than General Marshall. Uh, this was high praise. She was also very pro, uh, pro Jewish, uh, for a uh, very, very much an advocate for an independent Jewish state. Marshall created an organization called UNSCOP, United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, and he created that uh, around the no, it was summer of '47. And, the, and UNSCOP was a, an organization of 11 non-aligned countries. They had no particular uh, slant on the Palestinian Jewish uh, question who should govern. Uh, so they uh, were the, the core of this uh, investigative uh, recommending uh, committee which Marshall had created. Well, they came up with, an, with a proposal for uh, partition, for partition of Palestine into a Jewish state, an Arab state, and, and a, an international zone for Jerusalem. Uh, now, the, 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 you'd have to look at a map to see how it was partitioned. Uh, it, it wasn't a, a nice clean break of north and south or something like that. There were sections that were Jewish, and there were sections that were uh, ever going to be Palestinian or Arab. Uh, Marshall strongly supported the findings of the committee. And he uh, gave a speech at the UN uh, in which he announced his support. And he was attacked by his own people, by State Department uh, professionals, uh, the, the Near East desk and uh, Lloyd Henderson. Not attacked openly, but uh, they tried to undermine him. And he rebuffed the uh, Near East desk. Uh, and he simply told them that that's the way it's going to be. The decision was made. Marshall, Marshall did not turn for advice so much to the Near East desk. For technical information, yes. But he relied very heavily on a, a crew of professionals at the higher levels. His undersecretary was Robert Lovett, uh, a great statesman. And, uh, Later on, uh, the Secretary of Defense, uh, who Marshall uh, uh, trusted uh, implicitly with everything. Uh, there was Dean Acheson, uh, who was uh, preceded uh, Lovett. There was George Kennan, a legendary thinker and planner. And Marshall had hired him to run the new policy and planning uh, staff of the Department of State. The first time that we had ever had a planning staff uh, in any civilian agency of government. That started in the military, and Marshall uh, imported it into the, uh, uh, into the civilian uh, part of government. And, Henry, and uh, Kennan was, uh, uh, was renowned. He was, the, he was the father of the policy of containment. He was uh, regarded as, a, as perhaps America's best uh, global thinker. Well, that was the way it stood, and uh, there was a lot of jockeying. Uh, Truman asked Marshall not to lobby for the vote, uh, uh, and uh, Marshall didn't. Uh, but obviously, he was uh, he backed the proposal of UNSCOP, and it came to a vote in on November 29, uh, 1947, and the partition vote passed, uh, 33 to 13. And he, uh, Marshall, received plaudits from people like Eleanor Roosevelt, from Warren Austin, uh, and from uh, uh, Chaim Weizmann, who uh, was 
he was responsible for the Balfour Declaration back in 1917. He was one of the uh, foremost Jewish leaders of the time. Uh, Weizmann said to him, uh, quote, he, he congratulated him for the noble part you played in solving the millennial old problem of our country and our people. Clearly, uh, to this point, Marshall was a great supporter of the, uh, of the creation of a Jewish uh, uh, state in the Middle East, along with Germany. He also did something else in uh, late 1947 and early 1948. Have you ever heard of something called the Stratton Bill? Does that ring any bells? Stratton was a congressman from the state of Illinois. Uh, he and seven other congressmen were interested in bringing, uh, bringing Jews to America. You know, we always think about Jews going to Palestine. Why not to America? Uh, we had limited immigration, which, had, which the State Department had uh, originally uh, enforced. Uh, and so there were a, a lot of problems uh, to bring Jews to the United States. Uh, this was... Uh, very much a minority voice in the, in the Congress, the idea that we should have uh, uh, bring a lot of uh, Jewish people to the United States. Now, the Stratton Bill uh, would bring uh, 400,000 people to the United States of, of all faiths, uh, although the thinking was that most of the 400,000 would be uh, Jewish people from Europe. Uh, now, the, uh, that's far more than the British were bringing in, uh, allowing to come into Palestine, and was far more than any other politician suggested. And I, I think it's very instructive to read some of uh, some of General Marshall's words in support of the Stratton Bill. He testified several times. Here's what he said: If we practice what we preach, if we admit a substantial number. Then, with what others are doing and what and will do, South America is the same one. We can actually bring an end to this tragic situation. In so doing, we will also affirm our moral leadership and demonstrate we are not retreating behind the Atlantic Ocean. We are actually in a better position to receive a substantial number of these people than any other nation. We have numbers of the stock already in this country who know their language and who have the resources and the interest to assume the task of fitting a relatively small number of their kinsmen into our vast economy without expense to distinction in their resettlement and with a reasonable assurance that they will not become public charges. The bill went nowhere in the Congress. It lost uh, heavily, went down in the House of Representatives. The uh, following year, uh, Marshall made this statement about his work on the Stratton Bill. I have been pressing for the admission of a substantial number of displaced persons into the United States as I felt that the integrity of our whole position depended on our willingness to accept displaced persons. Some of the strongest opposition had come from persons whose only reason for opposing the measure was that they did not like Jews. Interesting and very little cited by those who suggest that Marshall may have been anti-Semitic. Uh, a stronger indication of how the British felt and how most of Congress felt, or much of Congress, the, at least the rest of the House of Representatives, uh, came from the um, the British prime, uh, Foreign Minister Ernest Bevan. Let me just read a short quote from Bevan in 1946. It will not be under misunderstood in America. I hope it will not be under misunderstood in America. If I say with the purest of motives that U.S. policy toward Jewish immigration into Palestine was because they did not want too many of them in New York. Well, up to this
this point, Marshall is a very strong advocate of partition. But he's developing reservations. The first the first thing that draws his attention is the Arab outrage to the partition movie. Uh, they say if there's any attempt to implement partition in Palestine, there will be all out war and they will, they, they will attack Jewish settlements all over the, uh, the land. Uh, secondly, Marshall makes his own military assessment of the situation. The population is about 50 to 1 Arab to Jewish. If you take a look at all these surrounding Arab nations around Palestine, 50 to 1. And also, uh, there is a, uh, all the military hardware is on the Arab side, most of it. The Arab Legion is by far the, the uh, most advanced, trained, and armed force in the area. In the area. And that's under British, uh, British influence. And the British uh, have made no bones about using that, arming and, and uh, directing the uh, Arab Legion uh, and having it uh, take over uh, much of Palestine, if not all of it. And you had a third factor that, uh, that got involved, and that was the Soviet, uh, the Soviet intention. The Soviets were back, had back partition. And, raised a lot of questions in, among American uh, State Department people and, and President. Uh, what was the Soviet aim here? Did they want to get involved in the Middle East to uh, become a competitor for the Jewish favors? They were supporting a Jewish state. Uh, what were they up to? So there was a suspicion about Soviet intentions of the area, which was also uh, gnawing at, uh, at Marshall. And there was the Kennan influence. Kennan was, uh, uh, was urging, don't take the mandatory uh, control from the British. The United States should not do that. And in, in, indeed, polls all around the United States supported that view. 81% of the population said the United States should not become the mandatory power in Palestine. And 63% of American Jews agreed that the United States uh, should not take uh, this on to themselves. What should be done, uh, there was uh, general agreement that, that there should be a, uh, a multi-nation force uh, in Israel, or in Palestine, I should say, uh, and that uh, the Americans should, should uh, have no more than a population proportion. Uh, and the Soviets should have no more than that, too. So that there should be a, a, a lot of nations involved in, in keeping the peace. Uh, Kennan was also uh, worried about the Soviet influence, uh, and he was also worried about retaliatory attacks on U.S. citizens and interests in other Arab nations uh, if the United States got heavily involved. And uh, he was also concerned about access to British and Arab interests in the area, which you might read as oil, which is not a bad thing when you think about the need that the United States defense required. We, we needed uh, long-term oil reserves for our military uh, posture. Uh, so uh, there, that, that was a factor. Uh, and then uh, he was worried about also uh, slowing up the Marshall Plan because many of the plans of many of the nations that were entering the Marshall Plan, the European nations, depended on the uh, importation of, uh, of uh, resources from, uh, from the Middle East and Near East. So all of, there's no question that Cannon's advice played an had an influence on Marshall's thinking. Well, before the question arose, uh, if you needed a force to implement partition, uh, where was it going to come from? And uh, the, the question was not answered by the General Assembly. The General Assembly has no power to raise, uh, to raise a, a force, a military force. 
So Austin, the ambassador to the uh, UN, uh, raises it with the Security Council. Uh, he asks, uh, is there uh, is there a force? Can we raise a force? Can the Security Council create a, an armed force to keep the peace in Palestine? And uh, so he takes that question to the council, and they answer it within a few days, and their answer is no. That the U.S. Char the U.N. Charter provides for the use of force only to keep international peace, not to keep peace within a country or within an area. Uh, and secondly, they don't. They don't. There's also trepidation about using Soviet. The Soviets want to put a lot of force in. Them. There's 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 fear of of that fact. So this is starting to lead to a change in the United States position. The U.S. Security Council says we don't have the power to, uh, to implement partition. We can't use force. Uh, and therefore, uh, we're staying. Uh, what can we do? Well, the U.S. position begins to change as and Truman is so speaking for it also. And he says, well, we support partition, but we have to search for ways to protect the Jewish population. So let's go back to a 1946 idea, uh, which was uh, floated by a joint committee of British and American uh, statesmen. And they suggested uh, a UN trusteeship, United Nations trusteeship, uh, which would work toward uh, getting truce between uh, Jews and Arabs, and also would work toward uh, developing a binational uh, government, a cooperative government of Arabs and Jews. And they, uh, and then we also supported an arms embargo. Let us keep arms from flowing into Palestine. So the UN uh, developed an arms embargo. Uh, as uh, from uh, Marshall's urging. So no arms flowing in. Uh, the idea is to, to work uh, to develop a truce, get a truce, while the British are still there. Uh, and uh, if at all possible, uh, work out some sort of a bi-national uh, cooperative governmental arrangement. Not a bad idea. Uh, today, in today's climate, uh, one wonders, gee, how would that have worked? Uh, probably very difficult to bring it about, but had it worked, it would have been uh, uh, miraculous. So where is President Truman uh, during this period? Well, now it's 1948. He's being hounded by lobbyists. Uh, he cannot stand Zionist lobbyists. They are all over him. And he's getting very irritated with them. And uh, particularly Rabbi Silver from Cleveland is a particular burr in this, under his sock. Uh, and he's, uh, he's threatening to just get rid of the whole situation, let the UN do what it wants to do. He, he's really pretty disgusting. In this climate, uh, Warren Austin, the UN ambassador, sees an opportunity, and he wants to make a speech to the uh, to the UN, and he asks uh, Marshall's consent. Marshall consents to it. So, but before he makes his speech to the UN, I'll tell you what the speech includes in a minute. They send a draft to Harry Truman, who's uh, vacationing down in the Bahamas somewhere. And he replies to General Marshall, and he agrees. He says, uh, yeah, OK. Let's go. I agree. I consent. So the next day, on uh, February 24, 1948, Austin makes a speech to the Security Council. And he, he in effect, asks a question. Do you wish to enforce the par to par do you, you wish to enforce partition? And the council's answer is, we cannot. We don't have the legal authority, and we don't want to. Uh, we can't do it uh, without force. And 
force is illegal under the term. On the, a few weeks later, uh, while the United States is working, this delegation is working within the UN to try to build something under this US UN trusteeship idea. And Marsh is working very hard at that. Uh, there's a secret meeting arranged at the White House between Harry Truman and a fellow uh, by the name of, oh, it, he, he talks to his old partner in the haberdashery business in Kansas City, Eddie Jacobson. And those of you who have read uh, McCullough's book, uh, uh, um, Truman, uh, probably know all about that. Jacobson pleads with his old partner, Harry Truman, and he said, would you please see Chaim Weizmann, this Zionist who uh, is such a wonderful figure, is an inspiring man. Uh, let him make the case. So Truman says, all right, Eddie, man, for you I'll do it. And so they let Weizmann in on the side, in the side door of the White House, and they hold, they talk for four hours, Truman and Weizmann, and Truman changes his mind. And he, he promises Weizmann at the end of that meeting that he supports uh, a homeland and an independent Jewish state, and he'll do whatever he can to bring that about. He is definitely on the, on the ticket now. He's, he's ready to roll. But you know something? He never communicated, Truman never communicated that he made that decision. He didn't tell Marshall, he didn't tell Lubbock, uh, Nobody in the UN delegation heard about it. Uh, so uh, whatever he was thinking, he was keeping it to himself. So Marshall really had no guidance, nor the UN delegation had no guidance uh, from Truman during that period. March 18th uh, to uh, on. So on March 19th, Austin makes a speech to the UN. Lovett and Marshall are out of town. Uh, they don't know about this. Uh, Austin makes uh, a statement to the Security Council, and he says, let's give this uh, problem of the trusteeship to the General Assembly and to consider uh, how that temporary trusteeship is going to work once the British leave during the summer. And uh, it really hits the fan after that announcement. The, the Zionists, uh, the, the upshot of that announcement on the following day was unbelievable. The, the press reacted. Uh, Zionists all over the world were, were outraged. Uh, Truman was embarrassed. He had given this promise to, uh, to Weizmann. And uh, here is this uh, terrible press coverage which says the which says, uh, U.S. Uh, changes its mind, uh, they're going to go with the trusteeship, and, uh, and that's, that's the course we're going to follow, the trusteeship, and, which leads to a truce and uh, some sort of worked-out governmental arrangement. Truman's embarrassed. He blames, he blames uh, Austin uh, for the timing of the speech. He said, if, if Marshall and Lovett were around, they, they could have been finessed. They could have handled it. They, they could have worked it out politically. Uh, so he was, he was uh, upended by the timing. And he blames, he blames the Near East desk in the State Department. He, he calls them the striped pants boys, did it to me. They've always been after me. And now with Lovett and Marshall away, they, they, they had their way. They were able to get the UN, uh, to get Austin to, to make the speech or this announcement. And uh, uh, that's what he said in private. In public, he said, uh, I back partition, but we need a truce under the trusteeship to work, work it out and to implement the partition. But he was, uh, he was in a corner now. Well, Marshall goes to work very hard now to try to get uh, agreement uh, on the UN trusteeship uh, and arrangements for a truce. And he meets with Jewish leaders, many of them. Uh, he uh, makes progress with uh, uh, Shertuk, uh, Moshe Shertuk, who is the head of the Jewish agency, which is basically the defense force. 
And Chertok and uh, Marshall, they, they come to partial agreement. They're, they're working on a lot of things and they're, they're, they're making progress. And he also meets with a guy named uh, Rabbi Magnus from San, San, from San Francisco originally, but he's, he's the president of the University of Jerusalem. And Magnus is the head of the peace camp in, uh, in Palestine, the Jewish peace camp. And he's working with Weizmann and others to try to make some arrangement with the Arabs, to talk to the Arabs and, and you know, moderate Arabs and try to put something uh, together. So he's, uh, he's delighted with uh, Marshall. It's very encouraging. And they meet. And he also meets with uh, David Ben-Gurion and Abba Iban and, uh, and others, other, other uh, Jewish leaders. Then there are three setbacks. To Marshall's efforts. Number one, unfortunately, Marshall makes a statement to the press. He's urged by Dean Rusk, who's uh, within the delegation, not to make that statement, but uh, he's assured by others that he should, so he goes ahead. And what he says is that uh, we are, we have been talking to Sheriff Talk and we have agreement on lots of the uh, points, and we're close to uh, a positive decision. We're working on it. Well, Shertok uh, reads that in the paper, gets, gets that news, and backs away from it, denies that, these, that that is true, and backs away from it, di disavows it totally, uh, can't deal with it, and, you know, the, he's embarrassed in, in Palestine because he's been, you know, putting himself on the line with Marshall, and now he's got this publicity. Well, that was a Marshall boo-boo. It was a, a rare mistake by the general. Secondly, the British moved the day of their leaving up. It had been sometime in the summer, now they said they're gonna leave on May 14th. And that strengthens the hand of the hardliners, those who need to go to war, who think they have to go to war and move quickly and militarily. So that's a, a real kick in the pants. And third, the urban, that, that uh, terrorist uh, element within the uh, Jewish agency, within the uh, Jewish military, uh, attacks the British uh, in many ways, in many in many places, and kills a lot of British soldiers. And that pretty much ends the, the peace camp uh, activity in, uh, in Palestine. So all those things happen in a very short period of time, and it basically uh, uh, destroys Marshall's efforts to work out some sort of uh, agreement. Well, this is the situation. Truman calls a meeting for May 12th. Still don't know what Truman is thinking. He calls a meeting for May 12th, two days before the, the British are, are uh, scheduled to leave. And the participants are on the White House side is uh, uh, Clark Clifford, who's Truman's domestic political advisor and heads the Truman presidential campaign. This is 1948. And if you know your history, you know that Truman wasn't expected to win. He's in a, uh, he's, uh, in a terrible fight to try to hold the presidency. Uh, and the Jewish vote is obviously important in New York, California, Illinois, uh, and other states. So. Uh, and, but Clifford, to, to speak well of him, uh, he, he's a, he's a uh, firm believer in the Jewish cause. And there's another staffer in the White House, a fellow by the name of Niles, who also is a very a great advocate of, uh, of the Jewish cause. Then you have on the other side, you've got Lovett is there, Marshall's there, uh, and one member of the uh, Near East staff, not Henderson. They don't let him in the room. Uh, they have one a guy by the name of Wilkins. He's, he's there, and a, and a liaison guy from State called uh, named uh, McClintock. So those are the participants in the room on May the twelfth. Uh, Marshall is very uncomfortable with uh, Clifford's presence. Why? This is a, a serious discussion on a public <coughs> policy issue of great importance, and Clifford is a domestic advisor. What's he doing there? So 
Marshall's hackle is raised. Is, is this going to be about politics? Is, is he speaking because uh, uh, this is part of the calculus for the presidential nomination? You know, Marshall's not a Marshall is not a Democrat. He, he doesn't. He, he's not a member of the Democratic Party. He told Truman not to invite him to party events. Uh, uh, take him off lists. Uh, he, he's a, a servant to the president. He's secretary of state. He's not a Democrat. He's not a party person. And uh, he feels that he feels kind of drawn in, like this is a political exercise of some kind. Uh, Lovett speaks first, uh, and he uh, lays out the case for uh, the. the UN trusteeship and uh, working on a truce and binational government. Uh, Marshall uh, cuts in and he says, uh, he re tells him about his conversation with Shirtok and says, uh, I told Shirtok that just because they won a few skirmishes, it doesn't indicate long term success. Uh, the, the Israelis really don't, or the Jews don't really have a very good chance at winning this, or that they're going to. Uh, uh, suffer and probably be uh, exterminated. Uh, then, in, then Truman turns to Clifford to speak for him, for Truman, uh, which is probably a very foolish thing to do. And Clifford uh, states his states the case for immediate recognition of the state of Israel as soon as the British leave. Now, does there need to be immediate recognition? Can it wait a few days? Uh, it, it, it seems awfully extreme. But that's the case that they make. And, and Clifford says it uh, absolutely has to happen. Uh, you got to beat the Russians into the situation, uh, beat, beat down because the Russians are ready to recognize. And you've got to uh, come in early to show your good faith and so forth. He's stating Truman's case, but it's Clifford's statement. Not Truman. Uh, Clifford gets done, and Marshall has an outburst. His, his temper goes sky high. And his points are three. Number one, Clifford's wrong. Number two, he should be here. He's a politician. He's a domestic political advisor. He has no role in a serious foreign policy discussion. And number three, he says to Truman, if I were to vote, George Marshall never voted in a presidential election. If I were to vote, I would not vote for you for president this year. <laughs> wow. Uh, Lovett continued, gave his rebuttal to Clifford, but the meeting was basically on ice. Stop. Truman basically breaks it up, stands up, everybody stands up, and Truman says, uh, I am inclined to agree with General Marshall. That's the way the meeting ended. <laughs> there were, at no point, as, as said in some fables, uh, that, that Marshall threatened to resign. He did not threaten to resign. Uh, what I told you about his statement about Truman's uh, uh, voting, not voting for Truman, was all he said. He was just ticked off. No question. Uh, and that ended the meeting. Now, what, where were they? They were it was in the shambles. There's no way that Truman was going to uh, support immediate recognition for Israel unless Marshall agreed. Uh, Truman absolutely relied on Marshall for credibility. So negoti negotiations start between uh, Clifford and Lovett. Lovett is a consummate uh, negotiator. Uh, and they work, and they work, and they work for two solid days. And they get to May 14th. Now, May 14th, the British are going to leave at midnight on May the 14th. That's 6 p.m. in Washington on May the 14th. At 5.40, 20 minutes before the British start to leave, uh, 
there's a conversation between Clifford and Lovett. Clifford goes in and tells the president that Marshall agrees not to oppose your decision publicly. He is not going to oppose it. The announcement is made. The uh, immediate recognition of the United States of the new state of, of whatever, they don't even know the name, there's a blank. And it's filled in, uh, running back and forth and talking to uh, a member of the Jewish agency. And uh, uh, what should we put in there? Uh, Israel. We just came up with a name. <laughs> we'll call it Israel. That decision was made just a few minutes ago in Tel Aviv or somewhere. And we're going to put in Israel. Israel. Uh, so they had a name. Uh, and they agreed, well, they can't give uh, recognition as a matter of law. They have to give recognition, what's called de facto recognition. Recognition is a matter of fact, not of law. Uh, so until the Israelis have a constitution and it's going to, they, they can see that it's a democratic government and, and some other things. So that's sort of the compromise or part of the compromise. Well, that's it. It's 20 to, 20 minutes before the British leave. The British now, uh, the announcement is made at, I think, 11 minutes after 6. So the British have left 11 minutes ago. And there is uh, pandemonium in the United Nations. The, the United Nations, the UN has pulled out the rug from under what they were thinking of doing. They're working on a, a trusteeship and a truce. And and have all these discussions, and we're having discussions in the General Assembly. And what's, what's America doing? It's changed its total position, and no notice to us. They, they just left. Or, or the, uh, Austin was so embarrassed, he went home. Uh, the ambassador to the UN, he just said, the hell with it, I'm leaving. So, and off he went. Uh, he was home trying to take it out of his mind. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt reported to Marshall uh, the day after what chaos uh, came from it. Eleanor Roosevelt, pro-Jewish, uh, for pro-Jewish uh, statehood, said even the, even the pro-Jewish delegates were outraged. The United, the United States uh, has destroyed its reputation in the United Nations. Uh, we'll, never, we'll, we'll never have leadership again. Uh, we've lost our credibility in the United Nations. Marshall, on the 17th of May, <coughs> has a meeting with Truman. And he, said, uh, he says to Truman, we, we must proceed on the embargo resolution adopted by the UN in this matter with extreme care or we will give a final kick to the UN. I went on to say that we, Marshall Lovett and the U.S. delegation, felt that the United States has hit an all-time low before the UN. So that's, that's where uh, it was. And that had been argued by Lovett at the May 12th meeting too, that the UN would lose the U.S. would lose credibility in the U.N. Okay, all that's a uh, prelude to the uh, problem of anti-Semitism because that really comes, reaches a high point not until 1990 with the publication of the book written by Clark Clifford, the guy who had the fight, with uh, Richard Holbrook, he wrote the book with Holbrook, who is a distinguished uh, uh, Deputy Secretary of State, or Under Secretary of State, famous, famous diplomat. And Clifford is humiliated. The worst day of his life was May 12th, that meeting. He was humiliated, felt humiliated by Marshall, called him names, said he spoke in a his words were a goddamn Baptist tongue. And he, yeah, let me read the first sentence from Tucker's book. My mind's eye roams over 45 years of a life in Washington. 
But my memory comes to rest first on a meeting in the president's office on a Wednesday afternoon in the spring of 1948, when the Truman administration faced the decision whose consequences are still with us today. This is where I shall start. The rest will follow. I'm getting signals that i got to wrap it up. Uh, Holbrook uh, gave the second kick uh, in 2008 with a, with a, with a uh, editorial in the Washington Post in which he said uh, that the situation was undoubtedly influenced by anti-Semitism of some State Department officials. He didn't say that Marshall was this anti-Semite, but public reading them could, could easily conclude that. So that was a, a, a real kick in, uh, to uh, Marshall's reputation. Well, uh, I don't have to go through Marshall's record uh, to tell you that on race and religion, he had an outstanding, a superlative record all his, all his life. He had many Jewish associates, and I refer to Bernard Baruch, uh, Henry Morgenthau, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Ben Shames, who was uh, one of his key analysts on the uh, Marshall Plan, uh, and others. Uh, and then there was the Rosenberg appointment in 1950. And Rosenberg, her name was Anna Rosenberg, and she uh, was a Jewish Hungarian, born in Hungary, a Jewish woman. 1950, Marshall uh, nominates her as, uh, as uh, Assistant uh, Secretary of Defense for Manpower and Personnel. And she's a terrific, a terrific hard-driving uh, pro. And, so, and it's a Korean War now. And Marshall thinks that they have to have a woman, a person like this in the in this job to, to get talent uh, because we're so demobilized and suffering in 1950 after demobilization. Uh, he's urged not to do it. He said that uh, he's told that the Senate will oppose it. He tells his people, you work for Rosenberg or you won't work for me. And he got that, uh, that he got that nomination through <coughs> and he testified it and they became great friends. Doesn't sound like an anti-Semite uh, to me. He uh, was a champion of uh, equality uh, throughout his career. I can point to the 92nd Division in uh, World War II, the Black Division, the 442nd the Nisai Division, Japanese Americans who fought in Italy, the Tuskegee Airmen, and on and on, which he personally gave money to uh, out of his own pocket to the Tuskegee uh, Airmen. He was the creator of the Women's Army Corps over great opposition in the Congress. Well, that's about all I have to say. Uh, I make, my final note is that uh, Marshall had a sincere belief that the UN trusteeship was the best, uh, was the best route to Jewish survival. He seriously, seriously believed that. And uh, and other USNs would be served too, including the Marshall Plan, exclude, including uh, the, the welfare of Arab nations. He was buying time. He didn't want to see a war break out. He thought the Jews would lose. He did a very rational thing. You can argue with him. You can say, well, the Jews are better prepared than you thought. Yeah, they did. The Jews were amazing. Uh, I don't know how they won. Uh, was there anti-Semitism in the State Department? Absolutely, yes. It was at those lower levels. But he went to Kennan, to Lovett, to Atchison, to Bowen, Chip Bowen, uh, and for in his deliberations, he didn't he didn't rely on the uh, that sort of anti-Semitic core within the State Department in his thinking. He uh, suffered from a lack of uh, guidance from Harry Truman. Uh, Truman uh, sort of kept him in the dark, didn't share with him uh, his change in thinking when he talked to Weizmann or why he changed. Uh, British haste was a problem, the British rushed leaving. When they left, they left all the uh, strategic points they could in Arab hands. Uh, but Clifford's role was a, was a big factor in the, in the blow up. Uh, and 
Marshall's distaste for bringing U.S. politics into a foreign policy uh, decision. Uh, so all of those played into it. And Truman never held it against Marshall. He never, Truman, to their dying day, uh, they, uh, they had great respect and love for each other. And we don't know how the trusteeship would have played in history. We can argue about it. Um, would have been lovely had it worked. Uh, I don't know how possible that was. The bottom line, uh, to view Marshall's opposition to be based on anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, anti-Israeliism, does a disservice to diplomacy and statesmanship, including Jewish statesmanship and is patently unfair to a man so honored and deserving of his unparalleled reputation uh, for honesty and integrity and in service to humanity. Thank you. I don't know whether I'm